Assembly. Good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be with you today. So let's get down to the bottom line here. GDP is slowing everywhere in the world right now. It has been for quite a while. And the reason is productivity has been declining for 20 years all over the world. And the result is we've got a lot of unemployment, especially among the millennial generation desperately trying to find their place in a 21st century workforce. Our economists are now projecting 20 more years of low productivity and slow growth. And now this economic crisis, which is structural, is giving rise to a much more profound crisis. We are now in real-time climate change. After two industrial revolutions, we've spewed massive amounts of CO2 and methane and nitrous oxide into this planet's atmosphere. And we now have the water cycles on the planet in an exponential runaway curve from climate change. Our ecosystems are collapsing. And our scientists are telling us we are now in the sixth extinction event of life on this planet. We've had five extinction events before we were ever here, human beings. But this one is quite interesting because our scientists are telling us that we may lose up to half the species of life on Earth in the next eight decades. The last time this happened was 65 million years ago. But then it took thousands of years for an extinction event. We're talking about the next seven decades. We are asleep. This is a wake-up call. This is about our survival. So we need to step back and take a look at how we create a new economic vision for the world. It better be compelling. We need a game plan to deliver on that vision. It needs to be quick. It needs to move in the developing countries. It needs to move in the industrialized countries. And it has to move in every city and every region. We have to be off carbon, this civilization, in less than four decades if we have any chance of avoiding the abyss. So we need to ask how the great economic revolutions in history occur. If we know how they occur here at the Committee of the Regions, we're going to get a road map. We're going to get a compass and how every region and city in this room can navigate a new journey for its people. There have been at least seven major economic paradigm shifts in history. They're very interesting. They share a common denominator that at a moment of time, three defining technologies emerged and converged to create what we call in engineering a general purpose technology platform, an infrastructure that fundamentally changes the way we manage power and move economic life. Number one, new communication technologies to more efficiently manage the economic activity, rather obvious. Number two, new sources of energy to more efficiently power the economic activity, also obvious. And number three, new modes of mobility to more efficiently move the economic activity, obvious. So when communication revolutions join with new sources of energy and new modes of mobility, it changes the way civilization manages, powers, and moves its economic life. First Industrial Revolution, Britain, convergence of communication, energy, and transport, steam power printing, the telegraph, converge with a new energy source, cheap coal. The steam engine is invented to harvest the coal, and then they put the steam engine on rails for locomotives. Communication, energy, and transport, manage power and move Britain. Second Industrial Revolution, the United States, 20th century. Again, communication, energy, and transport, centralized electricity, the telephone, later radio and television. Those communication technologies converge with a new source of energy, cheap Texas oil. Then Henry Ford put everyone on the road, cars, buses, and trucks. The Second Industrial Revolution took us through the 20th century, and it peaked in July 2008. When Brent crude oil hit $147 a barrel, a record price, if you remember that month, July 2008, the entire global economy shut down, and that was the economic earthquake. The collapse of the financial market 60 days later was the aftershock, because the entire civilization runs on carbon, fertilizers, pesticides, construction materials, pharmaceutical products, synthetic fiber, power, transport, heat, and light. We are clearly in the sunset of the second industrial revolution. And Citigroup reported last year that there's now $100 trillion in stranded assets in the fossil fuel industry, the biggest bubble in history right now. We are on the cusp of a third industrial revolution, a smart industrial revolution. The communication internet is, con is now matured. Everyone here has a smartphone. Half the human race is connected this morning. 
This communication internet that's digitalized is now converging with a nascent digitalized renewable energy internet so millions of people and soon billions of people can produce their own solar, wind and other renewable energy where they live, where they work share it offline or sell it back on the continental energy internet. And now this communication and energy internet that are digitalized are converging with a digitalized automated GPS and within five or six years driverless road, rail, water and air internet to create three internets to manage power and move the 21st century. This is a smart third industrial revolution. These three internets they, they ride on top of a platform called the Internet of Things. We're attaching sensors to all of our machines so they can create data and then send that data to the communication, energy, and transport infrastructure. Uh, agricultural fields and there are sensors in the factories and smart homes and smart businesses and smart warehouses, smart vehicles. They're sending data back. We are connecting everything with everything with everyone in a digital smart society. This is the infrastructure of the third industrial revolution. And what this infrastructure allows us to do is dramatic. What this infrastructure allows us to do is all of our businesses, our communities, we can dramatically increase our aggregate efficiencies, dramatically spike our productivity, dramatically reduce our ecological footprint, and reduce our marginal cost to create a very streamlined capitalist market in the 21st century with broad social entrepreneurialism and networks and help create a sharing economy alongside this new streamlined digital capitalist market. So then the question becomes, where do we go from here? Today, and this is an important day, it's been 17 years since we began this journey here in the European Union. Today, the European Commission has joined with the Committee of the Regions to launch Smart Europe, a third industrial revolution, a digital revolution. And we now have this morning here three flagship regions. Uh, you know, talk is talk, but you have to walk the walk. Does this work from theory to practice? We now have three regions that will be presented uh, this morning uh, that are flagship regions. Haute France, the third largest in region in France, the old industrial region of France in its fourth year of deployment. And we've just announced uh, the uh, first uh, member state, uh, the Grand Duchy of Luxembourg has just uh, finished a one-year plan there for a smart Luxembourg. And finally, last week, uh, the 23 cities from the Rotterdam and the Hague have just uh, announced their plans. So we have Xavier Bertrand from France, the president of the uh, region there. We have uh, Vice Prime, uh, Prime Minister Schneider from the Grand Duchy of Luxembourg, and we have Mayor Abu Talib here from Rotterdam and the Hague to talk to you about these test experiments. And what's interesting about them is this is a subsidiarity principle at work. These regions came together and their governments became facilitators rather than just deciders. And they brought over 300 people together across industry, civil society, the business community, the academic community. In over 12 months, they worked with our global team and they created these reports, which I want you to look at. These reports done by these regions are 150,000 word, 500 page reports that turn these regions into test construction sites for 40 years. It lays out all of how the businesses, the industries, the infrastructure will come together and actually create this transformation. The reason I say that is we are stuck on pilot projects now. Every region here can talk about the nice pilot projects we're doing. But the pilot projects don't make the infrastructure. The infrastructure has to come in, and this is going to involve every industry in Europe. Every region will have to involve ICT, Cable, telecom, transport, logistics, agriculture, power and utility, advanced manufacturing to lay out this 30 to 40 year infrastructure for smart Europe. And this means millions of jobs. Day one, infrastructure is jobs, always. So we're going to have to take all of the building stock of Europe in every region and transform every building in, uh, and retrofit it because you have to make the buildings efficient homes, offices, factories before you can turn them into the new third industrial revolution, smart Europe. That means millions of jobs for semi-skilled, skilled and professional labor. Robots will not put in the insulation, the windows and the doors, I guarantee you. And AI won't do this. Millions of human beings. We have to install then renewable energy technologies. And if you've ever seen a wind turbine come up, no robot's going to get up on that wind turbine and assemble it. And the solar panels on the roofs. 
That's millions of semi-skilled and professional workers. We have to take the electricity grid in each Europe now that we have an energy union policy for smart Europe, and we're going to have to uh, take and digitalize the entire electricity grid across every region and turn it into an energy internet. Who's going to put in the underground cable? Who's going to manufacture and install all those advanced meters? Robots don't do that. That's millions of workers. We have to take the uh, entire uh, uh, pow uh, the transport grid of Europe and move it from dumb to smart road, rail, water, and air. Who's going to manufacture and install millions of charging stations? This third industrial revolution, smart Europe, it connects through the buildings. The buildings are the nodes. They are the big data centers. They're the micro power generators. They're the charging stations. And those nodes connect, and you create a digitalized lateral infrastructure for Europe. How do we pay for this? The money is there. It's how we're using it. The European Union, we spent a lot of money on infrastructure. We spent, I, in 2012 was a recession year. I'll give you an example. We spent 741 billion equivalent U.S. dollars on infrastructure in that recession year alone, public and private. The problem is where it went. To a second industrial revolution of tele centralized telecommunication, fossil fuel nuclear power, internal combustion transport, and that productivity, that platform, pro that peaked 20 years ago. That's why we're not moving. Now, we certainly have to patch up the second industrial revolution infrastructure. We don't want it to collapse during this 40-year transition. But we need to reprioritize our funds so that some of it goes into each region and each city laying out this digital third industrial revolution infrastructure. Then the businesses can plug into the new productivity and create the new jobs. So the European Investment Bank has stepped up to the plate along with the European Commission, Mr. Juncker and, the, and Mr. Hoyer. And now, if you're a region and you want money from the EIB, the priorities are digital communication, digital energy, digital transport for the infrastructure, digital education for the workforce, and digital health care for the health of the community. And this week, I was in Frankfurt with the European Central Bank. We brought in bankers from across Europe. And we laid out this digital 2035 vision. And afterwards, the banking community, I met with the banking community, and they are ready to go in terms of helping regions and cities after you lay out your roadmaps to actually scale up infrastructure over 40 years. They're looking for investments, and they know they'll be paid back by the energy performance contracting so they won't lose. We now just have to put the banking community together with the commission and the committee of the regions and begin scaling. Last thought. I'm not European, but what I've noticed about Europe in the 20 years I've been here, Europe always has to have a new journey forward or it moves backward. It's just the nature of the game. And so you started with the coal and steel community after the war. Then the Maastricht Treaty created a political union. The euro created a monetary union. The 27, 28 states created a geographic union. And now this is the next stage of the European journey. People are worried about poli political extreme movements, about the fragmenting of Europe. This smart Europe is the way to engage every community under the subsidiary principle. These three regions here. They're busy getting their regions together. They're busy creating new businesses and jobs and infrastructure. And they are not worried about politics somewhere else because business is local and they've all come together. So the anecdote to this fragmentation is smart Europe, the next stage of the journey. Create an integrated single market across the EU and the partnership regions. That's a billion people. For the largest market in the world, digital, smart, clean, renewable, post-carbon where economic uh, opportunities start at the local and regional level, and they laterally scale across regions to create smart Europe. It's a plan. It's workable. We have three regions that have shown it can be done. And now with the leadership of the European Commission, the Committee of the Regions, then there are other regions here that have done parts of this plan as well. It's going to be the regions and cities that move this forward, and we need to do it quickly and intelligently and with uh, the will to bring in everyone in our regions into the process. So this truly becomes a European experiment for a one Europe. Thank you.